In non-ideal fluid dynamics, the Hagen-Poiseuille equation, also known as the Hagen-Poiseuille law, Poiseuille law or Poiseuille equation, is a physical law that gives the pressure drop in an incompressible and Newtonian fluid in laminar flow flowing through a long cylindrical pipe of constant cross-section. It can be successfully applied to airflow in lung alveoli for the flow through a drinking straw or through a hypodermic needle. It was experimentally derived independently by Gotthilf Heinrich Ludwig Hagen in 1839 and Jean-Léonard Marie Poiseuille in 1838 and published by Poiseuille in 1840 and 1846. The assumptions of the equation are that the fluid is incompressible and Newtonian. The flow is laminar through a pipe of constant circular cross-section that is substantially longer than its diameter, and there is no acceleration of fluid in the pipe. For velocities and pipe diameters above a threshold, actual fluid flow is not laminar, but turbulent leading to larger pressure drops than calculated by the Hagen-Poiseuille equation. Equation. Standard fluid dynamics notation in standard fluid dynamics notation, or all where, is the pressure loss is the length of pipe is the dynamic viscosity is the volumetric flow rate is the radius is the diameter is the mathematical. Constant pi is the velocity physics notation where incompatible units is the volumetric flow rate is the volume of the liquid transferred as a function of time, is mean fluid velocity along the length of the tube is distance in direction of flow is the internal radius of the tube is the pressure difference, between the two ends is the dynamic fluid viscosity, is the length of the tube the equation does not hold close to the pipe entrance. The equation fails in the limit of low viscosity, widen, or short pipe. Low viscosity or a wide pipe may result in turbulent flow, making it necessary to use more complex models, such as darcy weisbach equation. If the pipe is too short, the Hagen-Poiseuille equation may result in unphysically high flow rates. The flow is bounded by Bernoulli's principle, under less restrictive conditions by relation to darcy weisbach Normally, Hagen-Poiseuille flow implies not just the relation for the pressure drop above, but also the full solution for the laminar flow profile, which is parabolic. However, the result for the pressure drop can be extended to turbulent flow by inferring an effective turbulent viscosity in the case of turbulent flow. Even though the flow profile in turbulent flow is strictly speaking not actually parabolic, in both cases, laminar or turbulent, the pressure drop is related to the stress at the wall, which determines the so-called friction factor. The wall stress can be determined phenomenologically by the darcy weisbach equation in the field of hydraulics, given a relationship for the friction factor in terms of the Reynolds number. In the case of laminar flow, where Re is the Reynolds number and rho fluid density, V is the mean flow velocity, which is half the maximum flow velocity in the case of laminar flow. It proves more useful to define the Reynolds number in terms of the mean flow velocity because this quantity remains well defined even in the case of turbulent flow, whereas the maximum flow velocity may not be, or in any case, it may be difficult to infer. In this form the law approximates the Darcy friction factor, the energy loss factor, friction loss factor or Darcy factor lambda in the laminar flow at very low velocities in cylindrical tube. The theoretical derivation of a slightly different form of the law was made independently by Weidman in 1856 and Newman and E. Hagenbach in 1858. Hagenbach was the first who called this law the Poiseuille's law. The law is also very important especially in hemorrhology and hemodynamics, both fields of physiology. The Poiseuille law was later in 1891 extended to turbulent flow by L. R. Wilberforce based on Hagenbach's work. Derivation The Hagen-Poiseuille equation can be derived from the Navier-Stokes equations. 
liquid flow through a pipe assume the liquid exhibits laminar flow. Laminar flow in a round pipe prescribes that there are a bunch of circular layers of liquid, each having a velocity determined only by their radial distance from the center of the tube. Also assume the center is moving fastest while the liquid touching the walls of the tube is stationary. To figure out the motion of the liquid, all forces acting on each lamina must be known. The pressure force pushing the liquid through the tube is the change in pressure multiplied by the area. This force is in the direction of the motion of the liquid. The negative sign comes from the conventional way we define. Viscosity effects will pull from the faster lamina immediately closer to the center of the tube. Viscosity effects will drag from the slower lamina immediately closer to the walls of the tube. Viscosity when two layers of liquid in contact with each other move at different speeds, there will be a shear force between them. This force is proportional to the area of contact A, the velocity gradient in the direction of flow, and a proportionality constant theta and is given by the negative sign is in there because we are concerned with the faster moving liquid, which is being slowed by the slower liquid. By Newton's third law of motion, the force on the slower liquid is equal and opposite to the force on the faster liquid. This equation assumes that the area of contact is so large that we can ignore any effects from the edges and that the fluids behave as Newtonian fluids. Faster lamina assume that we are figuring out the force on the lamina with radius. From the equation above, we need to know the area of contact and the velocity gradient. Think of the lamina as a ring of radius, thickness, and length delta x. The area of contact between the lamina and the faster one is simply the area of the inside of the cylinder. We don't know the exact form for the velocity of the liquid within the tube yet, but we do know that it is dependent on the radius. Therefore, the velocity gradient is the change of the velocity with respect to the change in the radius at the intersection of these two laminae. That intersection is at a radius of. So, considering that this force will be positive with respect to the movement of the liquid, the final form of the equation becomes where the vertical bar and subscript are following the derivative indicates that it should be taken at a radius of slower lamina. Next let's find the force of drag from the slower lamina. We need to calculate the same values that we did for the force from the faster lamina. In this case, the area of contact is at r plus dr instead of R. Also, we need to remember that this force opposes the direction of movement of the liquid and will therefore be negative. Putting it all together to find the solution for the flow of liquid through a tube, we need to make one last assumption. There is no acceleration of liquid in the pipe, and by Newton's first law, there is no net force. If there is no net force then we can add all of the forces together to, to get zero or first, to get everything happening at the same point. Use the first two terms of the Taylor series expansion of the velocity gradient. The expression is valid for all laminae. Grouping like terms and dropping the vertical bar since all derivatives are assumed to be at radius r. Finally. Put this expression in the form of a differential equation, dropping the term quadratic in doctor. It can be seen that both sides of the equations are negative. There is a drop of pressure along the tube and both first and second derivatives of the velocity are negative. Using the product rule, the equation may be rearranged to. This differential equation is subject to the following boundary conditions. At no slip boundary condition at the wall at axial symmetry. Axial symmetry means that the velocity v is maximum at the center of the tube. Therefore the first derivative is zero at r equals zero. The differential equation can be integrated to. To find a and b, we use the boundary conditions. First, the symmetry boundary condition indicates at r equals zero, a solution possible only if a equals zero. Next the no-slip boundary condition is applied to the remaining equation. So therefore now we have a formula for the velocity of liquid moving through the tube as a function of the distance from the center of the tube or at the center of the tube where the liquid is moving fastest with r being the radius of the tube. 
poise oil's law to get the total volume that flows through the tube. We need to add up the contributions from each lamina. To calculate the flow through each lamina, we multiply the velocity and the area of the lamina. Finally, we integrate over all lamina via the radius variable r. Poise oil's equation for compressible fluids. For a compressible fluid in a tube, the volumetric flow rate and the linear velocity is not constant along the tube. The flow is usually expressed at outlet pressure. As fluid is compressed or expands, work is done and the fluid is heated or cooled. This means that the flow rate depends on the heat transfer to and from the fluid. For an ideal gas in the isothermal case, where the temperature of the fluid is permitted to equilibrate with its surroundings, and when the pressure difference between ends of the pipe is small, the volumetric flow rate at the pipe outlet is given by wear. Inlet pressure outlet pressure is the length of tube as the viscosity is the radius is the volume of the fluid at outlet pressure is the velocity of the fluid at outlet pressure. This is usually a good approximation when the flow velocity is less than max 0.3. This equation can be seen as Poise oil's law with an extra correction factor expressing the average pressure relative to the outlet pressure. Electrical circuits analogy. Electricity was originally understood to be a kind of fluid. This hydraulic analogy is still conceptually useful for understanding circuits. This analogy is also used to study the frequency response of fluid mechanical networks using circuit tools in which case the fluid network is termed a hydraulic circuit. Poise oil's law corresponds to Ohm's law for electrical circuits. Since the net force acting on the fluid is equal to wear, i.e., then from Poise oil's law it follows that, for electrical circuits, let be the concentration of free charged particles, let be the charge of each particle, then is the number of particles in the volume, and is their total charge. This is the charge that flows through the cross-section per unit time, i.e., the current. Therefore, consequently, and, but where is the total charge in the volume of the tube? The volume of the tube is equal to, so the number of charged particles in this volume is equal to, and their total charge is, now, since the voltage, we get. This is exactly Ohm's law, where the resistance is described by the formula. It follows that the resistance is proportional to the length of the resistor, which is true. However, it also follows that the resistance is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius, i.e., the resistance is inversely proportional to the second power of the cross-section area of the resistor, which is wrong. The correct relation is, where is the specific resistance, i.e., the resistance is inversely proportional to the first power of the cross-section area of the resistor. The reason why Poise Oil's law leads to a wrong formula for the resistance is the difference between the fluid flow and the electric current. Electron gas is inviscid, so its velocity does not depend on the distance to the walls of the conductor. The resistance is due to the interaction between the flowing electrons in the atoms of the conductor. Therefore, Poise Oil's law and the hydraulic analogy are useful only within certain limits when applied to electricity. Both Ohm's law and Poise Oil's law illustrate transport phenomena.